Let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning we can come and celebrate this precious gift of the Holy Spirit that you have poured out upon your people. And Lord, we ask this morning that you would be present with us in spirit and in truth, that we might hear your word. And Lord, by the power of the Holy Spirit, be able to apply it to our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Many years ago, Teresa and I were sitting on the patio late one night and we're talking quietly, just enjoying the end of the day in one another's company. The kids were in bed. <laughs> it was very peaceful. It was very cool. A great evening to relax. And suddenly I heard a sound on the carport that I assumed was probably animals. But as I came around the corner, two young men, probably late teens, early 20s, were trying to get in our door. And so I opened the gate and I yelled something fearsome and pithy. I said, hey! <laughs> it's how you say it. One of them just fell down. His, his legs were right off from under him. But the other took off running like you had fired him from a gun. Now, the one who fell didn't last there long. He was, he was up and running as well. So I took off after them. I ran two blocks trying to catch them. I was enraged that they would try to break into our home. I was just wanting to do what? As I walked back home, I was calmed down a bit, and, I, and the more rational part of my brain calmly asked, so, so what were you going to do if you had caught them? And I was wondering, was I going to give them a severe beating or just a good talking to? I mean, I was in my early to mid-30s. I was in really good shape, but I'm no Chuck Norris. <laughs> Did I believe that I was going to prevail for, against those two young men who did not seem to have any problem running away from me? I remembered that story this week as I was considering our 50th wedding anniversary. I want you to understand the miracle of our relationship and why we are so grateful for God's restorative work in our lives and marriage. Many years ago, Teresa and I were going through some very, very difficult times in our relationship. I didn't think we were going to make it. Reading books on marriage and meeting with our pastor just wasn't doing it. Neither one of us had had particularly good examples of what it was to have a good marriage from our, our homes. And I was just arrogant enough to believe that I could fix this. But our relationship, though we were professing Christians, our relationship with Christ was shallow at best. I remember the one day when I heard the words that I never suspected I would hear, I want a divorce. I didn't. But I had no idea how to turn things around and be the, the man that my wife needed me to be. The man that I needed to be. At that point, I don't know that she, she understood what she wanted either. What she did know is she did not want the life we were living. Things were a real mess, mostly my fault. For all intents and purposes, I was on the road most of the time anyway as a, as a truck driver. So what was I going to do? How was I going to, to make something happen? How would I turn things around so that my wife could see me fighting for our relationship and she would want to fight too? But she made it clear she was done with me. She was going back to school to get her college degree, and she did. That year was probably the most difficult year of my life. I prayed that God would change Teresa's mind and make her willing to continue to fight for our marriage. I remember the day when I was praying that I knew that God was telling me that what he wanted was for me to pray that he would change me. So I started crying out to God, asking him to change me, make me into the man that he wanted me to be, the man that I needed to be, and, and the one that Teresa needed me to be. 
Just like encountering the two young men on the trying to break into our home. I wasn't going to prevail in my own strength. And things would run their course and our marriage would end unless God intervened. Well, he did. And we just celebrated 50 years together. And as, and as I often say, we've actually enjoyed the last 25. <laughs> I found it interesting that the weekend of our 50th anniversary was also Pentecost. Today we celebrate Pentecost, which commemorates one of the most important days in Christian history. It's more important than the American Day of Independence on July 4th or any other celebration by our culture. It's the birthday of the Christian church. This day is honored in liturgical churches and in Pentecostal or charismatic churches because it's the day when the Holy Spirit was poured out in power. He arrived and he stayed. The disciples could not imagine what they were going to do when Jesus went back to the Father. He continued to assure them that he was going to send a helper and, and told them to return to Jerusalem to wait for the Holy Spirit to come upon them. I doubt that they knew what to expect. But Jesus knew the power that they would need to accomplish all that God intended for building his kingdom here on earth. On the first Christian Pentecost, the Holy Spirit was poured out and took up residence in the early followers of Jesus who believed that he was not only the Son of God, but the Savior. He was the Messiah, the very one that Israel had longed for throughout their history. And one of the advantages that they had was the awareness that what Jesus asked them to do in building the kingdom was impossible to accomplish without the power of the Holy Spirit and the authority of the name of Jesus. This morning, we want to look at the importance of Pentecost as we seek the path back to the very basis of our faith. Pentecost was a Jewish feast, and it was held 50 days after Passover. In the Jewish festivals of that time, the, the first sheaf was reaped from the barley harvest and presented to God at, at Passover. But at Pentecost, it was the first fruits of the wheat harvest that was presented to God 50 days after Passover. Jewish tradition taught that Pentecost marked the day when God gave the law. It was the best attended festival of the year. Usually the weather made traveling much easier, more favorable. It was a time when people from all nations would be in Jerusalem. It was the most appropriate time for the Holy Spirit to come in power. It was closely connected to Passover, the celebration of the time when the angel of death passed over the homes of, that had the blood of the, of the lamb on their doorpost. This is what happened, a blessing for the people of God while they were in Egypt. The spirit coming on Pentecost would now be associated with the saving event of Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection. The first celebrated, the first produce, the feast celebrated the first produce of the promised land, Israel's inheritance, just as the Holy Spirit is the first fruits of the salvation blessings to the believer. In the liturgical year, Pentecost is the turning point on the calendar. It's the tradition, transition from the gospel and the life of Jesus here on earth to Acts, the Acts of the Apostles. It symbolizes a time when Jesus' mission here on earth was finished and the mission of the body of Christ, the church, began. Pentecost is the final season of the year and begins what we call kingdom tide, or ordinary time. 
for disciples of Jesus Christ, it's the time where we have all focused on, since Advent, we are focused on what each spiritual year, uh, parts of the year, meant and what, what they're supposed to happen there. It's a time where all who have focused their lives on Jesus, his first coming, to the end at Pentecost, when he is gone and sends back the Holy Spirit. It's meant to prepare us to live as disciples in the knowledge of God's Word and the power of the Holy Spirit. And we'll see that from our passage in Acts 2, 1 to 11. And we'll see that what happened that day should not be seen as unusual or out of the ordinary for those who have, been, have come to Christ by faith, but as the way to stand against the kingdom of darkness in the light of Christ. Let's now consider our reading from Acts chapter 2, verses 1 to 4. It's now 10 days after the ascension of Jesus is going back to the Father. Jesus commanded them to go back to Jerusalem and wait for the coming of the Holy Spirit. For many, this command raises an important and legitimate question. What had Jesus given the disciples in John 20, verses 21 and 22? And how is it different from what they were waiting for in Jerusalem? Let me remind you of John 20, 21 to 22. Jesus had just come by. He's resurrected and has appeared now to, to the disciples. So Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. Dr. Red Whit uh, Dr. Rod Whitaker, uh, our New Testament professor at Trinity, who just passed away last weekend, such a saint of God. He's also known for an excellent commentary on John with InterVarsity Press. And he writes this, John's account describes a preliminary stage of preparation for ministry. The mission is inaugurated, not actually begun. The actual beginning of the mission lies outside the scope of the fourth gospel. There remains, therefore, room for the Pentecostal out outpouring, after which the disciples take up the mission in public, in the power of the Spirit, descending from Father and Son in heaven. Such preparation is clearly the point Jesus is bringing to the disciples to faith in himself and in the commissioning. A clue may be found in one of the strangest aspects of these first encounters. Thomas was not present when the Spirit was given, yet he is the one who confesses Jesus as Lord and God, a confession which is the work of the Spirit. This suggests that the breathing of the Spirit was not simply directed at the individuals present, as if one had to be hit by the molecules coming from Jesus' mouth or knows in order to receive the Spirit, but rather the Spirit is now unleashed into the world in a new way and begins to bring about new life where he finds faith. The disciples enter into a new phase in their life with God, but it's not yet time, the time of their active witness as it will be from Pentecost on. He goes on to point out that the conditions for sending back the Holy Spirit had not yet been fulfilled. And it would not be until Jesus went back to the Father and sent the Holy Spirit back as the helper, the counselor, the power from on high. Clearly, they would need, they would need more power than it was given to them by Jesus in their encounter with the resurrected Lord that day. They're going to go back to Jerusalem and wait for the power of the Holy Spirit to come in a way not yet experienced by them. In Acts 1.8, Jesus promised, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem in all Judea and Samaria to the end of the earth. The disciples were not strangers to the person and work of the Holy Spirit because they saw it continually moving through Jesus in his ministry. And they also experienced something of the power of the Holy Spirit as they were sent out in Jesus' name to cast out demons, to heal the sick, 
to bring sight to the blind and to take authority over the demonic. But Jesus had promised them a new coming work of the Holy Spirit. We read John 14, 14, 15 to 18. He says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments and I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him for he dwells with you and he will be in you. The disciples stayed with Jesus throughout his ministry on earth and they and they showed in, in their belief that he was the son of God and he was the Messiah. That they came to the knowledge of who Jesus was would not be enough for them to accomplish all that Jesus would send them out to do. In other words, they couldn't stay like they were and accomplish what they did. In Acts 1, 4 to 5, Jesus had told them to stay in Jerusalem. And he asked them to remember the promise he had made in, in John 14, 17. He didn't say how long they had to wait. And since the resurrection of Jesus, they were learning that when he makes a promise, it will come to pass. And it will be worth waiting for. But it may come in a way they never suspected. So they were waiting together when suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a rushing wind and it filled the entire house where they were sitting and divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each of them and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. What a powerful image of God's presence. Three signs of God's presence were witnessed, wind, fire, and inspired speech. The wind in particular is a, a symbol of the Holy Spirit's presence. In Ezekiel 37, 9, God tells Ezekiel to prophesy to the breath and command the four winds to breathe life into the, into the bones of the dead bodies. It was like God's prophetic word a creation where God spoke and new life was created. And in Genesis 2, 7, it says, the Lord, formed, the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath, of, the breath of life. And man became a living being. This wind at Pentecost had that kind of presence and that power because it was emanating from the Spirit of God Almighty. The fire is a symbol of, of the Spirit's cleansing and a judging power. As in John the Baptist's prophecy in, in Matthew 3, 1 to 12, where he says, I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I'm not wor worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. The spoken tongues here were not ecstatic utterances, but clearly the various languages spoken by the Jews who had come from all over the, the, from the Mediterranean basin. They come as far as Rome, from as far east as Parthia, which is now eastern Iran. And Luke tells us in Acts, uh, in verse 11, that we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. So let's read Acts 2, 6 to 7. And at this sound, the multitude came together and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? Those on whom the outward sign of the Holy Spirit, they experience an inner filling with the Holy Spirit. As the Spirit moves and inspires their speech, the believers are speaking languages for those in other places, and they didn't know those languages. It's a sign that something extraordinary and unexpected had happened because it's the promise that Jesus gave them. It's fulfilled all at once. They become witnesses in Jerusalem to those in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. 
And John Stott commented on the unity of the believers through this witness of the Holy Spirit. He says, ever since the early church fathers, commentators have seen the blessing of Pentecost as a deliberate and dramatic reversal of the curse at Babel. We read in Genesis 11, 9, that the Lord confused the language of all the earth and dispersed them from all over the, the face of the earth. At Pentecost, unity begins to be restored through the power of the Holy Spirit. They're hearing the voice of God through the, through the mouths of the disciples who did not speak their language. It was when they gathered to praise the Lord of glory. It broke a, a huge prayer meeting where people were moved by the power of the Spirit. And Bart and I saw a wonderful reminder of that at GAFCON, where people from 52 nations gathered to praise and worship God, their Lord, their King. And the Holy Spirit enabled us to gather in love because of our commitment to Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit brings unity, not division. In our gospel reading from, from John chapter 14, 8 to 17, the Apostle John recounts the words of Jesus concerning the importance of the Holy Spirit indwelling those who follow him. These promises were not meant only for the disciples who were with him, but for all those who believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and the only way to the Father. There will be three things that will be characteristic of the followers of Christ. Number one, this is a big one. They will begin to do the same works that Jesus did. And he said, and even greater because he went back to the Father. Number two, for those who love Jesus and obey his commandments, will be able to ask anything in Jesus' name and he will do it. So that in verses 13 and 14. But how could they know how to pray for those things that God will give? Paul would later write in 1 Corinthians 2, 9 to 10, But as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. And number three, the Holy Spirit will reveal all truth to those who love Jesus. There will be a clear distinction between those who follow Jesus as opposed to those who, do, who cannot receive the truth because they don't know him yet. He says that in verse 17. And God's truth is not subjective, but is found in his word, regardless of how we feel. Jerry Bridges in his book, Trusting in God Even When Life Hurts, points out, we must seek to let the truth of God rule our minds. Our emotions must become subservient to the truth. In Acts 2, 1 to 11, the crowd's reaction shows that when God's people are willing to wait upon the Lord, that he will move in them through the power of the Holy Spirit, and he'll do it in ways that are not predictable and are far different from anything that we would have planned and put on our calendar. In this one event that happened at the birth of the Christian church, we can see God's plan to reach the nations and the power of the Holy Spirit moving in and through those who were disciples of Christ. They would never be able to do this in their own power or their own abilities. If they had hung out with Jesus another 10 years, they would not have been able to do this except for the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. They had already proven that they were well-meaning but unreliable when faced with grave danger. In this one moment when the Holy Spirit is poured out on the disciples and approximately 120 other people who were there, everything from that point on changed. This was truly a, truly a birth has taken, taken place and new life with God. It forever changed what it meant to be a Christ follower. And those who are filled with the Holy Spirit only spoke, not only spoke languages that they did not know themselves, but only through the power and indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit, they spoke of the mighty words of God. 
The coming and filling of the Holy Spirit was so good, so essential for the work of the community of the early Christians that Jesus actually said that it was better for him to leave the earth so he could go back to the Father and send the Holy Spirit. It was God who decided how the Holy Spirit would be manifested to the city in Jerusalem. And it isn't likely that this was going to be a one-time event. After the day of Pentecost, the apostles spoke and moved in the power of the Holy Spirit. The apostle Peter in chapter 2, a guy who just a month earlier had denied that he even knew Jesus Christ three times. He stood up and spoke with a new power and clarity. He spoke to all those around who had seen the miraculous event, out, this outpouring of God's Spirit, this amazing thing that was going on all, all around them. He had not been expecting to experience what happened, and yet he's able to stand up in the power of the Holy Spirit. And he quotes from Joel chapter 2, verses 28 to 32, that what they were seeing had been foretold in detail that in the last days God would pour out his spirit upon all flesh. They found themselves doing that very thing. He preached the sermon, even implicating those who were around them that had put Jesus to death on the cross, the very ones he was afraid of only a month earlier. The power and the authority of his words caused 3,000 people to turn by faith to Jesus that day. What an altar call. Where did this power come from? It's the Holy Spirit. It's not rocket science, is it? It comes down through the ages that when the church loses its focus on the Holy Spirit and solely focuses on the doctrines of the church, that they found themselves fighting heresy and corruption with very little power. If you read about the different times of revival and, and reformation within the church and the coming to faith of thousands, it was the Holy Spirit that is moving through his people. It wasn't then, it wasn't because they had these great words, it was because the power of the Holy Spirit attended them. Any other way is, seen, is to be seen as out of balance. And de like we're depending upon God to do his part and we'll do our part and together this ought to work out. God is saying, no, you'll do it my way, through my power, through my authority. And men and women have found that they're not able to sustain, sustain a, a powerful walk with the Lord apart from his word and spirit. We just cannot do it. And this teaches us how to pray, asking God for the Holy Spirit to pour, be poured out in power in our midst, in and through us daily. That's how we're going to change the world. Let's pray. Father, we, we thank you. We thank you, Lord, that you had, had a better plan than we did. We thank you, Lord, that we have seen and throughout your word that waiting upon you is essential. But that, Lord, once, once the Spirit moves us, waiting is, is not the proper response. But we come to you in repentance for our nation and for our own lives. That, Lord, we have acted as if it was important that we do our bit and we try to do it with our own plans and in our own way, and it just hasn't worked. But Lord, I praise you that we're seeing outpourings of your spirit. And they always come in places that no one was planning on it. It wasn't on the agenda, but you moved in power. Lord, we're wanting you to do that here. We're wanting you to do that in the northern neck. We're asking for revival. We're asking for you to move in power in and through us. But Lord, Obedience to you, revealing the, the glory of Christ to others, and building the kingdom is our greatest, our greatest idea, our greatest responsibility. But I want it to be not just a responsibility, but it, it, our heart is crying out for it. 
So, Lord, like before, I ask you to change me, to change us. In Jesus' name, amen.